Who were the Flowers? They were two young girls from uh, Columbia. They were underage when they became your clients? Yes, sir. Two sisters, Elena and Hannah Plyler, trusted Alec Murdoch when they lost their mom and brother in a car crash. We have the story of how that trust was abused and their money misused. I'm Anjanette Levy, and welcome to Law & Crime's Sidebar Podcast. During Alec Murdoch's double murder trial, we heard about a number of clients that he represented related to lawsuits that he filed on their behalf, particularly during the cross-examination by Assistant Attorney General Creighton Waters. Two of those clients were children when Murdoch met them, Elena Spahn and her younger sister, Hannah Plyler. Who were the Plylers? <laughs> They were two young girls from uh, Columbia. They were underage when they became your clients? Yes, sir. Did they suffer a loss in their family as a result of an accident? They did. Who, who, what loss did they suffer? Who died? Uh, their mother. Their mother did. Joining me to discuss her experience with Alec Murdoch is Elena Spahn. Uh, she was just a kid when her mother and her brother were killed in a car accident. She was critically injured. And her attorney, Eric Bland, is with us as well. Elena, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, just tell me, take me back to uh, when this happened, the car accident back in 2005. And Alec Murdoch became somebody that befriended you. This is somebody you probably look to as, um, you know, a figure that could help you out in life, a father figure maybe? Right. So in 2005, um, July 16th, I was involved in a car accident with um, my mom, my brother, my sister, and myself. We were in um, Hardyville, South Carolina, and we were driving up to Columbia that weekend. So this was on a Friday evening. And um, coming through Hampton County on I-95, we had a tire blowout, and um, mom lost control of the vehicle, and that's when we uh, veered off and um, flipped over, hit several trees, and it was very clear that uh, my mom, my brother, uh, did not make it. And you almost lost your leg. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, what you're comfortable sharing. Sure. So during the accident, um, I was pinned in the vehicle and it was almost like a, um, an, an embankment. So I remember telling my sister, cause she was the only one that could get out. Um, I, I told her and instructed her to get out of the vehicle, go to the top of the, um, interstate and try to flag somebody down. Cause I was afraid that, you know, nobody would see our vehicle down in this embankment. So at eight years old, my sister's going to the top of the um, interstate and, and flagging someone down. And at that point there was an 18 wheeler that, um, had pulled over and also some other people that had pulled over. Um, and then when, uh, law enforcement and fire rescue, um, arrived, they used the jaws of life on me to remove me from the vehicle. And I was airlifted to Savannah hospital. Um, I had crushed my, uh, left shoulder, blew my left knee um, completely out and broke my right femur in two different places. Uh, those were the majority of the um, major injuries and, of course, significant loss of blood. Um, gone through about 15 surgeries in that first three years. Um, so, yeah, it, it, was, it was very traumatic. Elena was 12, and Hannah was just eight years old at the time of the crash. Their mother, Angela, and brother, Justin, were killed in that crash. Elena spent a month in the hospital and then went to live with family, including her father, who was separated from their mother at the time of the crash. He chose to go out just about every night, and just kind of me and Hannah there, and uh, we, we felt very out of place. Um... I was bound to a hospital bed for several months, so Hannah took care of me um, while I was in the hospital bed, and um, because I couldn't move and I couldn't walk, I had you know a cast on both legs, cast on an arm. So I, um, for several months, I, I I wasn't I couldn't do anything on my own. But um, once once I you know regained. Uh, movement in my arm, my legs, and did the therapy and everything. And uh, physically, I, I got better. 
um, that's when I started realizing like Hannah and I weren't necessarily as welcome in the home as the rest of the family was. And when they ended up moving out of uh, my grandparents' house, Hannah and I started getting shipped to different family members throughout our lives for several years, just because pretty much we felt like whatever family member needed that social security check that month, that's who we lived with. So Hannah and I lived out of bags, slept on couches for several years that people never knew about. Um, but I mean, we just, we, we did what we had to do, you know, to, to stay together. Elena and Hannah's father got an attorney who then brought on another lawyer to help represent them. That was Alec Murdoch. He's really good with talking with people. He was very convincing, um, very, very friendly, but also very um, adamant. Like, um, you know, what what they did was wrong and we're going to make this right. I assure you of this and and you're going to get all this money. You're never going to have to work another day in your life. I'm going to make this right. Um, and like, I trusted him and I felt like this is the guy to go to for sure. Um, he was just good with his words. He was very convincing that we were going to be okay financially. Um, and so I talked to him several times on the phone and then, um, eventually those led up to depositions for the case. So I met him at depositions. And so, but it was like meeting a friend. It was just like seeing a friend that I hadn't seen in, in, in a while, we had talked on the phone so many times. So by the time we actually met each other in person, it wasn't, it wasn't strange or anything. I remember him hugging me and, um, and there was a lot of people in the room and he, my nickname was Laney growing up. So he, so he would call me Laney and he would say, um, Laney, we're going to make this right. We're going to make this right. And, uh, even at the deposition, I remember him telling me that, um, he had a son, but he only mentioned Buster. I, I, I didn't even know he had two sons until later on. Um, and so he put himself in a position where he would explain like, you know, I'm a father, I've got a son, I've got a wife. And, um, so making it almost like he could connect to the case and like, he couldn't imagine going through that. So, um, yeah, that was the first time I met him in person, but the conversations continued on the phone through several years. You know, he would call me, letting me know that, uh, they're moving in the case and uh, things are looking good. He'd ask how my dad was doing. And so did the case actually take years for you to get money? I mean, or was this a, a case where the money was there and you just didn't know about it? No, no it took it's years. A, it's it a did year. take years. Okay. Yeah. yeah Ron, Ronnie Crosby of Alex's firm was really the hard worker. He's their go-to products liability guy on rollover cases and tire separation, tread separation cases. And so Alex was the point man that got the case from Arnold Beecham, but the guy that actually worked it and made them, you know, the value in it was Ronnie Crosby. So Eric, come into this now and tell me uh, where the wrongdoing occurred uh, between Alec Murdoch and Russell Lafitte. In her case, Elenia's and Hannah's, they appointed um, Russ Lafitte as the conservator. And so the initial filing was wrong. Um, they were not residents of Hampton County, so it never could have gone in there. And then once he was appointed um, a conservator, he got 5% of the settlement amounts. Hannah's um, settlement was like a little under 3 million or about 3 million. And Elenia's settlement was four and a half million because she had much more injuries uh, than and permanent injuries than Hannah did. And so he received just by the virtue of being named conservator, 5% of their money. And then going forward, he received a 5% annual fee to manage their money. Eric Bland said that Russell Lafitte then started loaning money to himself and Alec Murdoch from the accounts belonging to Hannah and Elena. He decided that he was going to loan conservatorship funds, which is an absolute no-no. The job of a conservator is, as the word says, to conserve, to preserve their funds. But he decided in, instead of putting them in an FDIC-backed CD that would be backed by the financial government, you know, these girls were not looking to get, you know, 20% uh, on their money. They wanted their money to be preserved. They were young and they 
they wanted it to make sure it would, when they turned 18, it would last. And so uh, Russell became a father figure to them. Didn't tell them that he was loaning money to Alex. Didn't tell them that he was loaning money to himself to, to the point that he had an existing loan with South State Bank, Alex uh, uh, Russell did, for seven and a quarter percent on a line of uh, equity that he had. And he took um, Hannah's money and paid off that loan, but then signed a promissory note to Hannah where he only agreed to pay her two and a half percent. So he lowered his interest amount that he was obligated. And of course, it wasn't secured. Yeah, he's using it as his personal piggy bank, their money. I mean, it's so ridiculous. And then he started loaning money to Alex. Um, and Alex, he knew, was an extreme credit risk with the bank because you heard in the murder trial that he was overdrafted any, at any given time, anywhere between $50,000 and $350,000. So he starts loaning uh, Alex money, unsecured. And again, Alex was always late. Alex wasn't paying interest on time. And so he never enforced those obligations. And at the same time that he's doing this very liberal loaning of the money of the girls, he's acting like um, he's Sergeant Schultz over their money when they needed money for school, for a, a, a band uniform or to go on a school trip, or to Disney World to go uh, with the school, he would all oftentimes say no. He would say, unless you produce receipts, I'm not going to give it to you. He did go to the court to get permission to give them up to $200 a month that he wouldn't have to go back to court. It could be up to $200 a month. But he's turned them down for cell phones he turned Elania down for a car loan. She needed a car when she was 16 years old to take Hannah to school, to take herself to school. She was in the band. Um, one of them was a majorette or something like that. He denied him a car. Um, it, it was ridiculous to see. They had to write these notes and beg him for their own cash. And, it, you know, he didn't need to give them a car loan at 18%. Because they had their money, at least uh, $600,000 worth, that was sitting in the bank. They could have paid cash. Oh. Uh, could have paid cash. Alec Murdoch brought in his friend, the CEO of Palmetto State Bank, Russell Lafitte, to serve as a conservator for both Elena and her younger sister, Hannah. Elena talked to me about what happened when that conservatorship ended when she turned 18. It was a quick 10 minute meeting. Like, here's all these binders inside here will be all the documents throughout the years of being your conservator. Basically good luck. Um, didn't give any kind of like direction, didn't give um, um, any recommendations on what to do with, with uh, this lump sum of money that was about to be wired to me. Uh, explained nothing to me. Um, it was literally like, a, I'm checking out, you know, and, and here's your, here's your paperwork. Have good luck. And so what did you do then? So took the paperwork, uh, you know, and at this point I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm getting told that I'll have $600,000 in my account in a couple of days. So I'm excited. You know, I, I, I should have been grabbed by the reins and come back down to life and be like, look, this is a lot of money. Let me help you invest it. Like, let's talk about investing it. Um, I mean, there was none of that. They literally, um, Russell just was, like you'll get some money in your account soon, six hundred thousand um, dollars, and that that was it. So when she was seventeen, she was tired of getting shuttled back and forth to different homes. So she goes to Russell and says, "I want to buy a house. I need stability." I mean, can you imagine a seventeen-year-old girl saying this? And so they went and looked at some homes, and Russell kept vetoing a lot of the homes that she liked, and actually made her buy a home that he liked more than she did because the kitchen was small and it, it didn't fit her needs, but she was so desperate at the time to get a house. So he buys her the house. He doesn't tell her you got to get homeowner's insurance. You got to get insurance to protect yourself against casualty, flooding, fire, whatever. So she turns 18 years old 
when she turns 18 years old, the conservatorship ends. Russell literally came and met her and just hands her for a box, a banker's box full of four or five notebooks because annually every year he would have to file some type of rudimentary accounting with the probate court. But he never disclosed in those filings that he was loaning himself money or Alex money. Uh, it just said loans. It didn't say loans to whom, loans to what, for what, repayment or anything. It just said loans. And he hands her these box of documents in a 10 minute meeting and says, basically, have a good life. In the meantime, Elena's house burned down, so she lost all of the records and financial documents related to her settlement. She says she kept calling Russell Lafitte to get those documents, but her calls were not being returned. Then came Labor Day weekend of 2021, when Alec Murdoch was involved in that so-called roadside shooting with his cousin, Curtis Eddie Smith. Russell and I had talked, you know, occasionally, occasionally here and there. He'd normally call me if he had a question about how to get in touch with Hannah or something. It wasn't like, hey, how are you doing? It was a, hey, what's Hannah's phone number or what's Hannah's address or what's your address? And it was very short, sweet to the point. Um, but he so it was kind of a coincidence because um, he had called me in the fall of 2021. Um, and. To let me know that um, SLED had contacted him and wanted all of our documents um, that he had during the time of our conservatorship. Several weeks later, I got a phone call from SLED. And I remember just recently, um, Russell told me that SLED wanted our documents. So I was putting two to two together then. And that's when SLED was explaining to me, like, no, we're, we're investigating these things with Alec and Russell. And obviously that's not what Russell told me. It was just the check in the box sort of thing. Alex was in trouble, but Russell was not. But um, it was, it was very clear that uh, Sled was explaining like, no, we're investigating things on both, you know, with, with Alex and, um, and Russell. And so I called Russell about it and I was like, Hey, so I just got a phone call from Sled and he's like, what did they say? And I was like, they, they were just asking if like I was Elena Plyler, if that was my maiden name, um, where I lived, where my phone number was, if those were good contact numbers and things like that. And he's like, well, well, did they, did they say anything else? And I was like, well, no. And then he's like, are you still in law enforcement? And like, he had never asked me like personal questions like that. Um, that was the first time that Russell and I actually had like a a um a kind of like a personal conversation like normally it was just very business like like hey Russell can I get some you know can I get the money yeah I'll 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 see what the judge says and then that would be that like it was very short but this conversation in 2021 was very different um and he was just asking me these odd questions but again I didn't think a whole lot of it Elena is a sheriff's deputy for Lexington County, South Carolina, so she could tell something wasn't quite right. Then Alec Murdoch started getting charged with a bunch of financial crimes. Russell Lafitte was then charged by the feds with a number of crimes, including wire fraud. She testified against Lafitte at his federal trial last year. I will say it was a lot different um, being put on as a as a victim on the stand. You know, I, I've, I've testified in court so many times. But it was different being on the other side. Um, it was, but I knew it needed to be done. Um, it was really hard. I had a lot of emotions um, just seeing Russell there. I mean, I almost felt guilty in a way just because this is a guy that, like like I said, like the best way to explain him, he was a father figure to me, you know, and now I see him and he's got the ankle monitors on, like he's he, he's not really making eye contact with me, but his family behind him was definitely making some um, facial remarks at us um, in his bond. No contrition, nothing. I let these girls down. They needed me. They didn't have a father figure. I should have done more. I should have given them a good transition when I gave them their files so that they could understand who to hire. They didn't, she didn't even know we needed an accountant. She didn't even know 
you know, about tax returns at 18 years old and different things like that. She's getting income. So um, Elenia definitely walked out of that courtroom saying to herself, not only did I did the right thing, do the right thing and did the right thing, but I'm glad I did it. So, so Eric, were you able to get all of the money that Hannah and Elena were due uh, through? Yes. Okay. And then some. Is that like, would that be kind of punitive damages, you know, that, that type of thing? Yeah, it's just how we, you know, we, we, we got as creative as we could to put damages on the table. Um, you know, the spread in the interest rates, but, you know, he charged her 18% on a car loan, which she had the cash to buy, and then litigation loans that were borrowed during the, the time that the original case was pending were between 24 and 29% interest, Anjanette, and they're six-month loans, so they constantly roll over. So, Elena, how are you doing now, you and your sister? I mean, you've gotten the money you're due and then some, but obviously you've been through something very traumatic. It, it's, it, you know, it's not, you, it, you know, it's the car wreck, losing your mother and your brother, and then this on top of it. How are you doing now? Yeah, I will say um, I didn't think that it was going to be um, as emotional and and I'll say traumatizing as what it ended up being. You know, I was like, you know, this is going to be fine. This happened, you know, 15 plus years ago. Like, let's just get this out of the way and be done. But as we're moving through this case um, over the past year and a half, it Han and I both realized like it opened up a lot of wounds and a lot of um, a lot of uh, trauma and emotions that we thought were you know were uh, dealt with 15 years ago started resurfacing and um, I'll tell you it, it it definitely has taken and has continued to take a mental toll on both Hannah and I. Um, not to mention, we also lost our father um, in September, this past September. So we've just had a lot going on, having to relive the death of um, our mom and our brother, and then the death of our father happening, and then just um, reliving the worst days of our life. Russell Lafitte was convicted at that trial last year, and he is awaiting sentencing. Then came the double murder trial of Alec Murdoch for the deaths of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. Murdoch was asked by Creighton Waters about Elena and her sister. Who were the Plowlers? They were two young girls from uh, Columbia. They were underage when they became your clients? Yes, sir. Did they suffer a loss in their family as a result of an accident? They did. Who, who, what loss did they suffer? Who died? Uh, their mother. Their mother did. It was so disconnected. And, and I remember looking at, at my husband and I was like, did he forget that there was a 14-year-old boy that also died in that car wreck? That was my brother. Like, did he forget that um, I, I was airlifted to the hospital because I nearly lost my life too? The same hospital he was airlifted in that roadside shooting. Did he forget about all of the other traumas? I mean, yes, of course, we lost our mom, but there was so much more than that, that I would have. So I found it pretty disrespectful that he made millions of dollars off of not only my deceased mother, but my deceased 14 year old brother. And you didn't have the audacity to remember him, but you say that you're a good guy and that, um, you know, that you would, um, you cared about your clients, but you, you forgot to mention about the 14 year old little boy that didn't stand a chance, but you made again, millions off of him. So that just really, that really bothered me. Russell Lafitte was convicted at that trial last year, as I mentioned, and he is awaiting sentencing. He will be sentenced at a later date. Right now he is requesting a new trial. Um, the victims will be able to speak at his sentence. And I'm pretty certain that Eleni is going to have choice words. I don't think Hannah will probably speak. She'll have me do it, but Elena will have some pretty choice words. All right. Well, uh, Elena Spahn and Eric Bland, thanks so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. And I'm sorry every, for everything you've been through, but uh, hopefully the future holds only good things. Thank you so much.